Off top, in the earliest days of football, touchdowns were worth four points, and the kick after was two points. The value of the touchdown went up to five points before settling in 1912 at the six points we know and love today with a one extra point kick or one point extra kick. I don't know. Makes sense. You get what I'm trying to say. Play the music. This is the Dominique Foxworth Show. What's up, Charlie? Not much. We got a special episode today. <laughs> yes, this is a special Christmas episode. Um, I got a lot of really good off tops coming. I started reading a book um, called NFL Century, and I learned a bunch of weird stuff. Like, I'm tempted to just rattle a bunch of weird football facts off, but I, I don't want to waste them. Then I'll be mad at myself in like three weeks when. I'm searching for some off tops. But anyway, special Christmas episode. I hate asking people for things, so I made you do it. You went and asked a bunch of people that we know and love for questions for this Christmas episode. And also, I do love giving people episodes for the holidays because I know how important it is to have something to jam in your ears while you're cleaning up after uh, present trash or you're getting ready for Christmas dinner. So... You're welcome. All right, Charlie, what are we doing today? This is the Dominique Foxworth Show Christmas voice mailbag spectacular to all the audience who says that we don't have guests. We have 14 guests today. <laughs> Each one better than the next. Well done. Um, and so the way this is going to work, our friends who love to give you compliments that you hate have given you questions compliments oh, and some love oh, God. and so they'll you made them the do video. compliments not only we're gonna edit all that shit out no 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 yeah, we're we're gonna gonna them if they were complimentary yes, we enough i'll add some compliments um but let's start uh, first question we have for you is from our friend bomani jones hey dominique man i gotta know what is your single favorite ray lewis story i know you got a good one i know you do all right, so Bomani and I have shared a number of Ray Lewis, Ray Lewis stories. One of my favorite Ray Lewis stories is a story that Bomani told me about how Ray, I forget the player, but Ray said that he was trying to knock somebody neck loose, which I just thought was a very descriptive way of talking about hitting somebody. I think my favorite Ray Lewis, Ray, Ray Lewis story I've probably already told. Uh, it's just about like, it's that, Tom Brady level of commitment to craft and love of the game. I remember having, I think it was a Thursday night game in Cleveland and Cleveland was terrible because they were always terrible and we were good. And we were still beat up from the week before it's Thursday night and we're in Cleveland. And I remember standing in the tunnel thinking, all right, like I, I wasn't like, let's go through the motions, but I was like, all right, it's a day at work. Let's let's get the job done. Get out of here. And Ray had worked himself up to tears in the tunnel and was so like intense and fired up for that game that I looked at him and was like, there are lots of differences between me and Ray Lewis, obviously. But the most significant one is right there like and it's not just me and him it's him and just about everybody else is like he had found whatever trick it was to or not even a trick it's just like it's how, how he was wired and I know everyone says that they're like that and everyone says they can't stand to lose and they love to win and they love this game and they're so committed and they they hate losing more than anything else and they always put their best stuff on tape and it's integrity like everyone says that Nobody really means it <laughs> like like 10 people uh, like really, really mean it. And we see a lot of people who know how to talk to talk. I remember seeing that and and thinking that I can't do that. And I know that people who are listening might be thinking that I was the aberration. No, I wasn't. <laughs> Most of us are freaking normal and we can't just like um, artificially create this level of um, intensity and it wasn't artificial for him it, and for most people it was hard to like get that level and the I think also like the emotional strain and he played for a long time and was that intense in college and that intense and, and yeah that's the other point is like 
he was already Ray Lewis by then. He had already won one Super Bowl. He was already probably the best linebacker ever. He was like on the tail end of his career. And it's not only the physical strain of the game, but to be like that every game, every week, and then presumably take it up a level in the playoffs, like that emotional strain. I've told this story to Bobani too before about when I was at the Falcons. It was probably the best year I had on the field, but the like toughest year I had like emotionally and mentally because it was a contract year and every game felt like I was playing for like my not my literal life but like the lifestyle I was going to lead for the forever and it was like that that pressure was ever present and it, it took a toll on me so anyway that might be the best Ray Lewis story that I can actually share Yep, that was the one. That's the one. Ray but Ray, my man. You, there had to be a couple times where he gave one of these emotional speeches and you guys were all looking around at each other laughing. Like in oh, your yeah, head. Yeah, you yeah, all yeah, 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 yeah. So like him being emotionally bought into the moment is different than him performing for the cameras and right. performing for whoever else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing about Ray that was like exceptional also, I mean, there's a ton of exceptional things, but another thing, that was exceptional about Ray is he was a guy who it's kind of like LeBron in that you hear about LeBron being really good at developing like team camaraderie and culture and like always being inclusive and stuff like that. And maybe LeBron's a bad example. Cause I don't know that anyone's allowed to like make fun of LeBron and maybe he even has more power or not. Maybe he had even more power than Ray Lewis. But the thing about Ray that was impressive was like, he was a hall of famer already and already great and we all made fun of him he made fun of us and it was he like i don't want to say brought himself down to our level because he still got some special treatment but like when he would give those corny pregame speeches like Suggs would would roast him for it and we'd all laugh and he'd play along and it was cool it was like uh i don't know it's just not something you would expect from somebody with that level of intensity that presumably takes the game as seriously as he does and takes himself as seriously as he does. He was cool as hell. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. All right. Next I'm question. Surprised. I am. I am shocked that Ray Lewis made I mean, fun of himself. That's the biggest revelation. Oh yeah, so he far. did. <laughs> he did all the time. He would make fun of himself and, and he knew we would get him for whatever stuff that he did. And like the age stuff, we'd make fun of him for that. He'd make fun of himself for his, his speeches when I think what people who had been there for a long time, no one had been there as long as he had, but people who had been there for a long time would call him out when he used something that he used before <laughs> and he would he like laugh it off. Yeah. He'd laugh it off and then he'd go out there and knock somebody neck loose. Yep. And then everyone would shut the hell up and play ball. It's fair. All right. Next question. I think that's got... it's, it's like the security that comes with being able to knock a neck loose. It's like, yeah, that's right. you can make fun of yourself when we all yep. know. That we don't want to mess with you. All right. Sorry. Next question. Bill Barnwell. Up next. Dominique Foxworth. This is your friend, Bill Barnwell. We miss you over at Debatable. I have a question for you. You were ecstatic to see your beloved Jeff Saturday take over as the head coach of the Indianapolis Colts. It went well for a week. Uh, Things have not gone so well since then. We will see what happens. But. If another ESPN personality could take over as the head coach for a team in any major sport, or I guess minor sport if you're so inclined, who would you like to see take over a team and why? Consider, pretend there is a documentary happening and you get to watch that documentary each week. So pick a personality, pick a team, talk to you soon. I mean... (sighs) My first instinct is to go Dan Orlovsky because I think he's someone who would who actually like wants to be a coach at some point. But when Bill said pick a, a like a documentary, then it was less about who I think wants to and could and I would be rooting for to get that opportunity and more about me getting some laughs. So yep. the answer to that question is Bill Barnwell, I think, is <laughs> to be a head coach of a football team. Like, that'd be outstanding. Because it's yeah. not that he doesn't know football, but he knows football quite well. But football culture is, like, <laughs> dropping Bill into that locker room and having him give a pregame speech? Oh, gosh, it'd be great. 
Yeah, that seems outstanding. Who are who would you put? Like, I think Mina would be a fun watch too. Uh, but she also like I think would be great. I think she actually would uh blend into the football culture. Oh yeah, a little bit more easily. Like she she's got it in her. If you've ever she, watched the game with Mina, the Lego like, too. Oh yeah, she is intense to a level that is like not nerd like at all. Um, who else could you think of? So I had a few for for the documentary okay. side of it. Jesse Palmer, host of The Bachelor, used to in the moment <laughs> interviews. He would give great, great, great interviews. Uh, I want twelve men coaching the U.S. men's national team. Oh yeah, um, Taylor doing yeah, that, like that. That would be hysterical. Um, and then the one that I think would be the funniest would be if we're talking about Last Dance doc- documentary. It's got to be Kendrick Perkins coaching LeBron team. It's, it would <laughs> hands down be the funniest thing ever because he, nah. he would start telling stories about when he was in the tunnel, how tough he was, <laughs> post players of the past. I, I like Kendrick Perkins, but I don't know if I like him coaching a LeBron team. I well, want Kendrick he's, Perkins he's with, a, little, with a bunch of young players. Well, the thing is, Perk is in the LeBron is the goat camp. Oh yeah, I know. And and so that's you need someone who's all in. You need, okay. and I'm thinking the last dance. 10 episodes of Kendrick Perkins being like, and then I dumped the ball into the post. And I was out there. I was on the sideline, but I was ready to fight. <laughs> yeah. 10 episodes of, of Perk, big Perk doing anything will be outstanding. Yeah. I think, I don't know. I was trying to think of anybody else. Obviously not people who were former coaches like out of Rex Ryan. That's not fun. Although Rex Ryan is pretty funny. Yeah. Just generally being himself. I don't know, dropping Greenberg into a situation, Green, letting him coach great. the Jets would be would be pretty awesome too. I feel like this is a good question because we can't go wrong. Or is that a bad question when when all the answers are right? I don't know. Thanks, Bill. Greeny, uh Greeny is the NFL commissioner. That's where I want him. <laughs> Rewriting the rule book. Um all right, next one we got Mina Kimes. Hey Dominique, this is Lenny. Mina's translating for me. Uh my question's a football one. Talk a lot about MVP. Which football player this year would you say more than any other has that dog in him oh lena's I haven't seen lena's in a while he's ageless all right football player has that dog in him i mean they all do who's the some more than other yeah obviously uh ray more than me and everyone else i've ever met um I'm trying to think of an example in game situation where somebody was over the top, gone too far, a little too much dog in them would be more fun. Hmm. When has that happened? I mean, I think it might be Josh Allen. Hmm. Cause like him diving all over the place and trying to like um, helicopter for first downs and games that, that seem not that like they're consequential games, but they're not John Elway in the Super Bowl helicopter is understood games. It's like, what are you doing? We're, we're going to need you later in the season. So if that's how we're defining that dog, I think. But it feels unfair to give it to a quarterback. Yeah. Hmm. Can I Let's give a, can I give two options, both on your beloved Ravens? One that I'm okay. sort of joking about, one that I'm not. If I was if I were to take this purely at the like earnest level, give me J.K. Uh-huh. Dobbins because he keeps breaking off these long runs and his knee is like destroyed, so he's limping on these like forty yard runs, Those and that's gross. about as I hate watching doggy as it gets. But mm. tough as shit, gross but tough yeah, as shit. The tough. other Justin Tucker, the man's a kicker, and you see him on the flight roasting other teams' quarterbacks. Like if that's not the most got that dog uh. in him for <laughs> toughness compared to positional value and positional respect. Yeah. I don't know what yeah. is. Yeah, Justin Tucker is. Yeah, it's just excellence, though. Like it's not dog and Justin Tucker, but he he's pretty great. He missed a couple kicks not too long I ago. Know. Well, one was blocked, which was like was shocking. You know, things are bad when when Tucker is missing anything under sixty yards. The J.K. Dobbins stuff, like yeah, he's fighting, but I hate watching it. Yeah, like those long runs, and he's like kind of limpy. It's like, hmm, I hate it, and he can't pull away. I hate it. But yeah, those are good. I like it. Um, I feel like I need to pick a, a defensive player though. Let's see. Oh, I think Fred Warner. I yeah. saw I, I posted on Twitter not too long ago. I saw 
um so you everybody knows by now if you follow football like you use motion one of the reasons to use motion is to get a team to show their defenses and manners on they motion fred warner or they motion the running back out or the tight end outside to the number one position outside of receiver fred warner follows him which is an obvious um indication that you're in man coverage because why would the linebacker be like ostensibly in a corner situation? They snapped the ball. He played a perfect cover two technique and that defense was covered two. And I was like, damn, that is so impressive. It reminded me of, um, I saw Shaq Leonard do that and do a deep third. So they motioned him out. Eber Flus was the coordinator. I think it was in um, Leonard's second year. They motioned him out. And he's outside. We're like, oh, this is cover one. He played deep third and overlapped the slot receiver. And I was just really impressed at the athleticism. And dogs are much smarter than cats. So I'm going to go ahead and say that dog includes intelligence. They are. I mean, I have a cat. And I was surprised because I assumed, I feel like yeah. popular culture will have you believe that cats are smarter or maybe they just are just more just flat out disrespectful, but having That's had dogs my whole life um, and my wife last Christmas, my wife really wanted to get the kids a pet, but she did not want to. And I did not want to commit to um, taking co- taking care of another creature because we got three youngish kids. We got the cat because cats, they are easier. They're easier, yeah. but they are not smarter. You You know, you're getting a dog at some point. Pup- oh yeah i would the thing is i like coming. dogs yeah i like dogs i'd love to have dogs ashley's allergic but of course there are some hypoallergenic dogs my only issue with not wanting a dog right now is it's gonna be my responsibility oh yeah i mean it's, <laughs> yeah, and it's I don't, 35 I don't, and raining right now and i've already been yeah. out with, with my dog exactly i don't times. i don't need that i Bye, stared Ashley. him in the eyes he stared me in the eyes um jacqueline's gonna be here with you cool I'll be done recording in a second. <laughs> exactly why I don't need a dog because Ashley's going out and I don't need to have to worry about walking. Just empty mm-hmm. that litter box a couple times a week. It's pretty easy. That's it. Feed him, put a little anti flea medicine on the back of his head every now and then, and we're good. Lamar is self sufficient. Hmm. All right. Next one. We got Gojo. All right. Michael Jr. Gojo. Okay. Right, everybody knows who Gojo is. Making he's making sure. Just because he's outside of the ESPN family does not mean he's no one knows who he is. All right, here we go. Hey, Dominique. Hey, Charlie. Uh, uh, big fan of the pod. First time as ever. Time. Uh, I want to combine two um, sports talk debates because people always love to do the could the best college team beat the worst NFL team. And then when I was in college, all of my football teammates firmly believed they could pick a starting five from our team that would beat our Division I men's college basketball team in a pickup game. So I want to flip it for my question for you guys. Do you think you could pick a starting five of NFL players right now that could beat a, let's say, dead dog average Division I men's basketball team, Power 5 team, but outside of the top 25? Let me know. Thanks, guys. That's a good question. I mean, my initial reaction is hell no. Yeah, depends if uh, depends if it's call your own fouls. Yeah. However, I think if you have all what is it, eighteen hundred players in the NFL, I assume that there's five of them. There's probably a hundred or so of them that could have been Division One basketball players. Definitely. Yeah. And probably a few of them that could have been high level, but realized that this was the better path. Hmm. But they haven't been playing, you know, and haven't and and practicing and focusing on it. I think that to to make it an interesting conversation, because I think that you are you're trying to suck the fun out of this by just like, no, they're better. Yeah, I see it. Anything. I, I see it in your stupid glasses. That you hate the idea that I'm even entertaining this. No, so, entertain away. I, if I tweaked it a little bit, I think that if we take this Division One team, the players on that team, their starting five, 
we take them back to their level of play their senior year of high school and we take our best five NFL basketball players back to that same level I think we probably win because you're talking a mediocre um a mediocre at least in my my estimation a mediocre uh power five school has no NBA players on it yeah like there, there's there's nobody on there that like stands out that's special it's my belief that of the NFL guys, maybe there's some people that maybe could have made a bench roster somewhere. You don't think there's any like McDonald's All Americans? Yeah, probably you're McDonald's All American. You're playing back. You're, you're playing, playing basketball, hoops. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. biggest thing. So and here's there's it, probably here's a, a lot of Mister Mister Basketballs for a lot of states out there, and the, the average team don't got no Mister Basketballs on them. First of all, I'm just imagining when Tony Romo had a one day contract with the Mavericks and looked hilarious on the bench. Oh, um, it was but funny. I think you're right. If you brought it back to high school, <gasps> you would yes. have a lot of guys who could play. I'm looking at the Ken Palm rankings right now, and I'm looking at mid level Division One teams. We're talking like a Wake Forest, a Syracuse, uh, a Nevada type team, Vanderbilt, Georgia, those levels. They would still get absolutely roasted though because there's one thing with the nfl all of those guys at their biggest would be college small forwards that's fair at their absolute biggest and but i mean the mid-level uh college team they got six six nine centers they're not out there with seven footers some of them are yeah some of them are and if you're seven, if you're seven foot and you're a sophomore in college at a mid-level team, you're not good at basketball. Probably not. But I'm just I'm just saying like there would be a big height discrepancy, which would make it very tough. Okay. With that said, you're right. They would all the, the, the NFL team would be much more athletic, much faster. Right. Um, press and- the whole game. I mean, just we rely on defense, full court press. Rick Pitino is coaching the uh, NFL team, which would help a lot. Um, the all right, next one we got, Gojo. we got Charles McDonald. Oh, yes. I was feeling a little upset. Let's see, Charles, give me something fun. What's up, Fox? It's yours truly, Charles McDonald, a.k.a. Four Verts, here to wish you first a Merry Christmas. Uh, it's been a cool year, right? Had a lot of fun together this year on a certain show and certain podcast, but uh, I'm doing this video because Charlie asked me to, and I had one question for you that's football football related as we enter the holiday season and the end of the holiday season. Really, have you ever seen a team have a more pointless season than the current Los Angeles Rams? They've lost like all their quarterbacks. They've got Baker Mayfield wearing number seventeen out there. They don't have their draft pick for next year. Aaron Donald's hurt. What do you think? No team has played a more pointless season than the 2022 Los Angeles Rams. All right. Well, Charles, good friend. He also has a great podcast. I think everybody that's been on so far has a great podcast. So you can listen to all of them if you want some more. Um, I hate this question, though. Hate it. (laughs) Terrible question. Terrible question. Because there have been lots of teams that have pointless seasons Every and commander didn't win a season Super for the Bowl. last 20 yeah. years. <laughs> and didn't win a Super Bowl the year before. This season is not pointless. They put that Super Bowl on layaway. And they are now making their payments for layaway this year and next year. So, no. Season's not pointless. It has a point. It just, the point, it started with a point. Yeah. Their season started last um, February when they won the Super Bowl. And now the rest of it is just... It's sad because they still don't have any fans, but right now, yeah, that's that's the point. The point of this season was to win the Super Bowl last year, and now they'll rebuild again. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, quickly, you had like that as a Commanders fan. Yeah, every season's a pointless season. And I would, I, I honestly, the most pointless season in the NFL this year is the Denver Broncos, uh, yeah. because they went all in this year to be one of the worst teams in the league, and they're screwed yeah. for the next five years. So, Ugh. sorry. Blind and what you got? All right, here's my question for you. I have an elf wrapping. She's gonna be mad at me for that. It's Christmas time. Okay, so who is the most overrated Christmas character ever? 
What's the most overrated Christmas movie ever? Who's the most overrated offense in the NFL right now? Who's the most overrated defense in the NFL right now? Who's the most underrated movie character of all time? Who's the most, or what is the most underrated Christmas movie of all time? Who is the most underrated offense in the NFL right now? And who is the most underrated defense in the NFL right now? Merry Christmas, bud. Oh, man. I love Dan. I appreciate Dan. But there's no way I'm answering all those damn questions. That's ridiculous. The full <laughs> podcast on its own. <laughs> yes, it is. Does he want to be a, a guest? Like, geez. Um, which one of those are we going to answer or which let's, few? So I think uh, overrated and underrated characters. Overrated and underrated characters. Okay. So I think what's that um Christmas movie that they play all the time when we were growing up? It's like an old Christmas movie. Um like black and white. It's so overrated. I can't even remember the name of it. Hold on, I'll look it up. All right. Christmas movies. classic christmas movies a wonderful life that's the one overrated what are the characters names in that movie they're all overrated that movie's overrated it's not it doesn't get me in the mood and they play it every year like it's uh important christmas uh ritual it doesn't do it for me you like that movie don't you you look like you like that movie no nah, couldn't care either way it's not, yeah. it's not even on the scale of me of me rating it if uh, I okay. see a movie in black and white, if look, if your movie came out before they can convert the movie to be HD, before it could be 16 by 9, if I see the bars on my TV, uh, I'm flipping the channel and never thinking about it again. What's so, I mean, I think the Grinch is an underrated character, generally. Oh, yeah. I, I love the Grinch as a character. Do you celebrate Christmas? Yeah, yeah. American holiday. Oh yeah, no, I know, yeah, I know. I, I gotta, I, that's why I asked because I did. Oh yeah, I mean, like we might be like the worst. I mean, we're we're metropolitan Jewish, Jewish by culture, not religious at all. Like, uh, yeah. so you know, we yeah. cook cook some big pork roast on Christmas in the most <laughs> way possible. <laughs> Open all of our presents. It's great. Um, Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer. That was that like claymation cartoon. Mm -hmm. That's overrated. Elf. That's a pretty good Christmas movie. Underrated. I, Elf is properly rated because that movie's just oh, good yeah. and just held up. Yeah. Uh, uh, Die Hard has to come up because I feel like you have to mention that as a Christmas movie because it is a Christmas movie. Or are you one who believes that Die Hard's not a Christmas movie? I've never seen Die Hard. Oh, interesting. You should it's watch a it. Hole, hole in the resume. Um, do you, you know what it's become it. slightly underrated at this point? It's not really a Christmas movie, but Bad Santa um uh, yeah the movie is absurd it would never get made now in any way of course but not. very funny of course not um love actually overrated christmas movie Ooh, hard disagree hard it really? gets me in my feels every single time i love rom-coms <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm not i don't have a problem with rom-coms but i don't know that one it feels so cheesy to me i don't know what else I, we got? uh i have friends who saw Hugh Grant at a hotel in New York and he's they said that he was just like sitting around waiting to get recognized because he's like slightly Aww. past his prime now and they're like it was we went up and asked for a picture because it seemed like he wanted one. Oh well that was nice of them. Uh Polar Express. When did that come out? I feel like you might be I was like a kid. Oh four. Yeah that's what I was gonna say I feel like that might I'm too old. I didn't I wasn't introduced to Polar Express until I had kids myself but I feel like you you might have loved that one. Yeah, solid movie. Um, all right, I think we we handle Dan's questions. We we talk about overrated and underrated offenses all the time. Um, yeah. So, next one we got our our friend Spencer Hall. I do love Spencer. <sighs> He's the only one with uh, a beard appropriate for the season. Mm -hmm. He should spray that thing white. So, Fox, I am obsessed with Dick LeBeau reading The Night Before Christmas to his team every year and how much some of these grown men seem to not only enjoy it, but cherish the experience. 
what teammate of yours was a huge softie for Christmas, and if you do have one of those, um, what did they do? Hmm. That's a good question. So I don't know if I had a, a teammate that was a huge softie for Christmas. I remember um, we just had some guys with personalities that would surprise you. So like Brendan Iron Badezio with the Ravens was just like just a big personality. He was like a real um, good special teams player. And he'd surprise, I guess he wouldn't surprise us anymore. But like, I think generally his general demeanor was unusual for the locker room. And just a very upbeat, very happy, like a tough as hell, but not like not a tough guy. You know what I mean? Like not that tough guy bravado. Like he seemed to be a little bit more emotionally mature <laughs> than most of us who were like out here trying to like convince everyone that we were tough. And Brendan was like, hey, I am who I am. And they go knock somebody's head off. So it, uh, he's the one who I think like who I think would be most likely in the Christmas spirit, but there was always guys. I remember Jake Plummer would like, I feel like he wore a Christmas. This might not be true, but in Denver, I feel like he wore like a, a Santa costume at some point. Just generally, there are a lot of weirdos on a football team, man. So <laughs> no one was ever like really into Christmas, but a lot of just interesting characters on every team I played for. Hmm. You could buy Jake Plummer Christmas ornaments, $10 an ornament. He was a great um, guy. I liked him a lot. Um, all right, next one we got our buddy, Wozny Lambry, Big Woz. Oh, Big Woz. Love Big Woz. I know this is going to be funny. He wouldn't just go straight in with something normal. Brooklyn. Yo, what up? Dominique was popping. Charlie, what's good with you, big dog? Um, as you guys know, I'm a loyal, faithful listener of the show. I was watching on YouTube the other day, and Dominique was in a hotel room with his family in New York City. Um, and I was wondering to myself, I was like, when is Dominique going to get the hell up out of D.C. and finally just move to New York City? Just just come on over to the dark side of New York City, Dominique. Um, I understand that both you and your family have, excuse me, you and your wife have family ties in the D.C. and Maryland area, and it's very convenient to be around the loved ones. But as you know, as a New York City commuter uh, from D.C., it's it's not that hard to get back down there when y'all need to. And, yeah, man, you got all of this work. You on TV damn near every single day in New York. You need to just... Come on over to the dark side. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Bomani's already done it. It would be just perfect for you. And, and again, I'm saying this as a New York City expat. I live in L.A. now. But still, I love to see people become New York Cityified. And, you know, I could even suggest a neighborhood. Mind you, I'm not wearing this Brooklyn Dodgers fitted by accident. Um, I'm going to put you in Brooklyn. I'm going to put you in, I would say, either Fort Greene. Or Clinton Hill, because I don't want to put you in bed -Stuy. You know, this is, you know, whatever. You're close enough to bed with the folks. Very close to the seaport, okay? Uh, so no time commuting to work all the time. And yeah, man, all the trappings of both Brooklyn um, specifically, but New York City as a whole, all there on the ready for you. So yeah, man, Do Dominique, man, when and why haven't you moved to New York? <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate Wazdy. He loves New um, York. Yeah, he does love New York. New York, he loves New York so much that he left it. Um, I lived in New York for one year and I loved it. I would have stayed there, but my wife was pregnant with our third one, and she was like, you know what, we're not gonna do uh is live in New York with um strollers and going up and down subways and doing all that stuff and living in no matter how big the apartment is, it's still a small apartment for for um, a couple with three kids. So that's what it came down to. We lived on 115th at Riverside. It was perfect. It was like out our window. We had Riverside Park, so it wasn't too noisy. And we could go right over there and play and stuff. And a kid's school was like three blocks, like two or three blocks away. The um, older two kids school was like two or three blocks away. So I love New York. I would definitely not live in Brooklyn, though. Like I... I would no disrespect to Brooklyn, but to me at least, like Manhattan, if you gonna if you wanna be there, I don't need to cross the water. I wanna be where where the where the the stuff is. That's where I need to be. Um, I guess if I had to go to Seaport every day, I'd like to be a little closer than 
one fifteenth. But this is probably getting in the weeds for everybody else, <laughs> and in the weeds for me too because we're not moving to New York because uh, it's not my family. I got like three family members that I uh, talk to. Ashley has like forty, and they all live in DC. And uh, maybe four if it's adoptive me because if you and Pablo oh. were both in New York, I would have to move to New York too. <laughs> and I, I love New York, it's the best city in the world, but I'm, I'm not ready for that. Um, I do love New York. Uh, next one, our our buddy, our beloved Ryan Parakeet Cortez. Oh, hello, Dominique. Hello, this Parakeet. is Parakeet Cortez. <laughs> In case you couldn't tell, he needs a, a, a question like for you, a sir. Sound. I feel like I would like to know. Can he make a pair at what age after he says, "I'm Dominique Foxworth"? Cortez. Stop believing in Santa Claus. Oh. Now I imagine Dominique, true skeptic, doesn't believe in anything. Might have been two years old and was already doubtful. You tell me. <sighs> so this is a tough question because we have lots of young listeners. I'm sure all the kids and probably parents who potentially listen to this with their kids. I would say that I don't ever remember believing in Santa. Same. I had an older brother. Same. He was only two years older than me, but I had an older brother and, and um, a, uh, friends in a school that, very much was in the real world. <laughs> it was like, what? Like, I remember making fun of kids in like second and third grade because they were like, Santa's coming. And also, like, my parents, they played the game, but my parents weren't like, Yeah, you got presents they, from Santa, but you knew. Yeah, but they, they weren't like, I don't know. They weren't like biting cookies and leaving them out. I don't think Elf on the Shelf was out yet. They weren't doing all the little things. Like they they played the game, but they never like leaned into it to a degree. I don't know. So yeah, sorry, Parakeet. I I want to know. I hope he still believes. He seems like he still has the Christmas spirit. The Heat need a Christmas mi miracle to be relevant. So I'm sure he's believing <laughs> right now. Um, uh, you know how to upset him, but he does need a yeah. sound. I feel like after he says "I'm Parakeet Co Cortez," he needs to say "tweet tweet" or something. He used to have that drop of Will Kane making fun of him for. Being oh, we need we right. gotta bring that back. Um, we gotta bring it back. All right, next one from my buddy, your buddy, one of our favorites, Billy Gill. Oh, Billy, I love it. We're just staying in Miami. Well, I guess Parakeet doesn't live in Miami, but he certainly reps Miami. We got a lot of Miami coming up. Okay, we're Billy looking good. Hey, Fox, it's Billy. Uh, just you know. Reaching out to you, catching up as friends do this time of year. Wanted to ask you something though, as you know, one of the greatest minds in football these days, uh, Hall of Fame, brain, Harvard grad, borderline Hall of Fame player. No one breaks down the league like you do. Historian, player apologist, all those things. So. With the 50th anniversary of the Immaculate Reception coming up this weekend, um, as someone who knows the game better than almost anyone, was it a good play or was it good luck? That's a good question. Yeah, I mean, I think it's fine to... to um, I think the answer is obvious. Both? It's good luck. Yeah. No, I mean, it was... It was a great play by Franco Harris, obviously. I think that coaches would say, this is why you run to the ball, and this is why you never give up on a play, because the Raiders kind of gave up on the play. They thought it was over. Franco Harris wasn't in the in that particular right route combination, but he found himself in the right position. So I guess the right answer is both, but... It's definitely more luck than anything, but yeah. I, I don't think it matters. Yeah, you get yourself in that position. The the four Super Bowls is enough to say that it, you, you can't have a lucky dynasty. So that particular play, Billy is so funny. He's the best. We love you. <laughs> if we have a guest on this podcast, you're at the top of the list. Um, the Duke. The Duke. Uh, next one, Kevin Clark. Oh, he's a Miami guy too. Mm -hmm. Not Although, a football expert like I think Billy. He, 
Yeah, I think he lives in Brooklyn now, right? He's large, up large there trying. Oh no, that's right. They moved out of the city because we got a baby. Yep. All right, Kevin. Hey Fox. Around this time of year, there's always a handful of teams who are coming on hot, and everybody says, Oh, you do not want to see this team in January in the playoffs. Everybody's scared to play this team. Nobody wants to play Jaguars with Lions or any of these teams that have won a handful of games recently. Oh, and I'm curious if that's an actual real phenomenon. Do players sit around saying, like, Ooh, we really don't want to face this team. We were, oh boy, these guys are hot. They're getting hot at the right time. Is that an actual phenomenon that if the locker rooms, if you're a three seed, two seed, one seed, or do players even care? Do players even watch this stuff late in the season? Okay, so I think it's different now than it was for me because like I actually didn't have to turn on the TV and didn't go to ESPN. So I wouldn't hear these things and wouldn't read the sports section of the Denver Post. Um, but now with social media, you can't avoid it, I think. These guys are on social media, so they hear these things. To his original question, so I, I, I think that guys do hear it, but I don't think that guys feel it. I mean, to his original question, no. First of all, no one would ever say it, and you wouldn't sit around the locker room saying, damn, I don't want to play this person or this team. But it is a media construct because normally it's the team that you would want to play the most because it's normally somebody who isn't that good but is playing well right now. Right. And the teams that you don't want to play are the teams who have the one seed. Uh, so and it could backfire on you anyway. I think we had a two seed my first year in um, Denver and the team we like we weren't saying it, but they drafted three corners. I was one of those three corners because Peyton Manning put them out of playoffs the year before. And then Peyton Manning had the one seat again. So we were kind of prepping for that game. And that was a team we didn't want to see, uh, but no one would actually say it. They lost. We ended up playing the Steelers and losing any damn way. We got the home playoff game. We we're supposed to be going to Indy to play Peyton Manning, but we had a home playoff game and ended up losing anyway. So yeah, I, I don't think that's a real phenomenon. I do think that we are generally normal people. So we're rooting for the underdog because you want to play the worst team. Yeah. More than anything, I think that comes up is I, I don't know. I I feel like I don't want to play in the division, which I, I don't think I've ever done that in the playoffs. But when that happens, I feel sorry for uh, the teams that have to do that. I don't want to play a team for the third time. It just just becomes a rock fight <laughs> you know like we all know yeah. each other too well it just never feels it never feels good and it's not exciting as a fan i don't think although yeah. michigan and ohio state would be pretty fun in the national championship yeah that'd be uh st stunning if georgia doesn't get there but yeah yeah um, i don't know i mean i guess like duke and unc that was really I was, fun grew up a unc fan seeing yeah. them retire too. coach k yeah. I actually, I miss Coach K this season, so they can't retire him again. Um, yeah. Let's uh, let's move on. We got our old buddy, our oldest buddy, Danny Levitard. Oh, Dan, make an appearance. Oh, well, not an appearance. Hello, Dominique. I was just curious at ESPN, which of your ESPN colleagues has been most as a teammate like Hall of Famer Ed Reed and which of them has been more like the kicker the kicker that you didn't respect Ed is trying to be a shit stir okay all right so I guess his best and worst teammate at ESPN so obviously the worst was Dan Levitard I'm happy we're rid of that kicker who I mean honestly I was being I was being like facetious but kickers are most are the player most likely to like be unusual and not fit <laughs> culturally <laughs> and I think that Dan qualifies for that and um I like the kickers and I always like Dan so uh he fits that category um let's see and I think the 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 egg question is hard to, to answer because I think it's what he's 
implying is like who was really helpful to you professionally. Uh, which like Dan kind of fits that too. Poppy, hate Dan. Poppy. Poppy. Show didn't work without Poppy. He hey, was the last buddy. line of defense out there. He was center buddy. field when those <laughs> when those plays were were about to be taken to the house. Oh, gosh, yeah. All right, I'll go Poppy. But I mean, everybody's so yeah. It's it's a weird thing at this company. It's like everybody's really nice and also like super competitive. But like everybody's mm-hmm. really nice and really helpful, and like it feels weird when somebody is not like we see now. It's like you call some people like, "Hey, send a video." Everyone sends a video. Everyone's really nice and ha- and helpful and kind and smart and also cutthroat competitive. I'm not as competitive as they are. Like I I I, st- I stomped out that part of my personality a little bit. It rises up every now and then, and I try to stomp it out again because I don't want to be that guy. But anyway, right. yeah, good yeah. question, Dan. Well, so- um, I'll go ahead. Let's move on to someone who's not nice at all. Who's are we going to get in trouble been... for having Dan on the podcast? Don't like a lot of people hate him. Nah, nah, I think we're good. Um, he didn't. He <laughs> I didn't... was joking. You, yeah. you, you didn't laugh. You got uncomfortable. No, no. For a second, I was like, "Is is he allowed? Is he?" <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out. We'll blame Christina uh, if it if it doesn't work out. The next one is someone who's just not nice at all. Not been our friend, Pablo Torre. Oh gosh. Here we go. Hey guys, um, Pablo here. Hey, Dominique. Hey, Charlie. Um, thank you for asking me to do this. Um, I, I put a lot of work into this question. Um, I know you guys are doing your uh, famous mailbag. And so I just wanted to say that I absolutely love listening to the Dominique Fox with Joe podcast and getting to know both of you on Debatable. Now, my question is if you could switch bodies with any animal for a day, which one would you choose and why? I promise it's not as debatable as some of the topics we cover on Debatable. But I just had to know if you'd rather be a majestic eagle or a sly fox. Pun intended. Um, definitely, definitely a pun. Uh, there is definitely a pun in there. A pun written by a human. So, uh, yeah, if you let me know your thoughts, um, that'd be great. Oh, man, I hate how much I like Pablo. <laughs> it bothers best. me. It's a terrible angle, by the way, Pablo, too close to your face. Um, also, I do love chat GPT. And so him incorporating that and then the animal angle, it's all good. So I don't know what I would want to go for. I like lots of animals. I feel like octopus, maybe? Mm. I don't know. They, they're, they're very intelligent. They have um like decentralized nervous system so like their arms or arms their tentacles kind of think on their own but they still all work in unison i find octopuses um quite fascinating um yeah i think that might be the right answer i mean i don't know being a dog also seems pretty cool yeah there are a lot. Of, like, there are a lot of really good ones. I mean, if it's just yeah. for a day, yeah, being a Kobe beef wouldn't be bad. Just get fed sake <laughs> and massaged. Sounds pretty nice. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I definitely think it would be a, a ocean creature. Yeah, just because it'd be it's not know, it'd be a, a interesting. No, nah, not flying. I know flying's cool, but I, I don't know. I feel like there's more interest. So, like, look up. Ain't much up there. You know, there's a lot more interesting stuff, I think, in the depths of the sea, like a deep yeah. sea creature, or, uh, uh, like an angler fish or something with how, vile. How much could you explore in 24 hours? Plenty. I mean, I've been in a plane before. I know what the earth looks like from up high. Yeah. Like no one knows what the, the deepest part of the ocean looks like. Like we have no clue. Like, let's get down there and figure this out. Fair point. All right. Last one. The finale, and we saved this one for last because he is your best friend, uh, okay. Greg My Greg Cody. Friend. Oh gosh, I hate Greg Cody. Do I have to answer this? Uh, you at least to have to watch to it. it. Hey, Dominique. Hey, it's Greg Cody from the Greg Cody Show with Greg Cody. Um, I don't really have a question, but well, I take that back. I do have a question. How come you big timed us earlier this year when we asked you to be on our show? You know what? I'm never going to appear on the Dominique Foxworthy show. I can promise you that. Wait a minute. 
Am I on it now? Damn it. So you're not on the Dominic Foxworthy show because <laughs> my name is Dominic Foxworth. So um, my hatred for Greg runs deep and it's only gotten stronger after watching. What is he, is he standing on a like a rotating like uh, pottery machine? Why is he spitting? Oh, I have no idea. I have no idea. All right. Well, I need you, Charlie, to appear on the Greg Cody show podcast. I think we can make that happen. For a long time, when I was voicing the questions for debate, uh, for highly questionable, people thought it was actually Chris Cody's voice because they think we sound alike. So I may, might right. be able to slide in there. Let's do it. We'll both go on there and we'll grill Greg Cody with some hard questions about how selfish a human being he is and how uh, lazy and lucky he's been. He actually makes me laugh sometimes, which makes me angry. Uh, he he makes me laugh a lot. Uh, uh, fuck a, the f- a good song. Butterfinger. <laughs> He's got a good Butterfinger song. If you haven't heard it, you should hear it. All right. That's it. That's everybody. That's it. That's our Christmas special Christmas episode. All right. You guys can go rejoin your family now or just start this over and listen to it again. Rate it. Review it rest of the podcast hosts ain't doing nothing this week they don't deserve a review or rating we do merry christmas thanks christina buswell thank you adi khan thanks sarah abbott and charlie kravitz big thanks to you for doing the dirty work that i don't want to do and getting all these people to send in questions because i hate asking for stuff bye this is the dominique foxworth show 